Well, maybe there's a chance for me to go back now that I, I have some direction. Wonderful. Thank you, baby girl. Love that song. Love you singing it. Love it when you're home. Love it when you go to New York. <laughs> Which she may be doing next month. She, uh, she's a very busy, creative little genius. And um, she, I love you so much. I'm so proud of, of you, of your growth. And love all of you, every one of you, name by name person by person, individual by individual. We celebrate your unique presence in the earth and the contribution you are and the contribution you make to all human beings. We celebrate your divinity, your, the enunciation of your presence and the pronunciation of your existence is important to the general flow of life or you wouldn't be here. So we welcome you, we celebrate, and we, we sanctify the moment. Thank you, Pastor David, for your contributions each week. Gerald, we love you. We think you're a genius and a prince in this house. Pastor had to go teach a class or he would have stayed. Um, and of course, the point finishes in a moment. My mother celebrated her 90th Thanksgiving uh, this weekend. 
Our baby girl brought, my baby sister brought in a, uh, we had already given her a 90th birthday, but my baby sister brought in a cake, and I hadn't even thought about it. Happy 90th. She's had 90, th 90 Thanksgivings. I don't know how many she remembers or how many she's thankful for, but she had 90 of them. <laughs> uh, the song that Madge sang, and welcome to this place that, that David led us in um, earlier, go along very much with the things that Marlon already said and with the theme of the month, which is seeking God or seeking source or seeking force or seeking spirit. I say seeking self. That when you're seeking God, you're really seeking yourself. We're going to change the name of this ex service to experience. And it's not just experiencing God. It's really experiencing yourself as one or experiencing your God self. And when we sing songs about worship and about the name of God, and, and God is not a name. God is a title. The name of God is whatever your name is because you are the only God experience that you're going to have is when you experience your deepest, most real self. And when you study and experience and then express that self, I think that may be as close to God as you'll ever be. In fact, as close to anything that you'll ever be is your experience of that thing. You've heard me say before many times, if you say you love somebody, you're saying you love the part of yourself that you experience when you're with that person. Same would be the case if you said, I can't stand so-and-so. You're saying, I cannot stand how I, f I cannot, I don't like the way I feel about me when I'm in that place or with that person. The only person you'll ever love, not love, like or not like is you. So life has everything to do with how you experience yourself. And how you experience yourself is how you express and expose yourself and what you attract to yourself. So rather than seeing God as something way out, and I'm calling the title of mine today, your infinite self, which is your unfinished or unfinishable. That's what the word infinite means. It has no end. If somebody puts a finish on you or that they have defined you, they have limited you. So don't look for definition. Don't be defined by or confined to anything yet. Just keep moving and evolving and experiencing uh, and expanding yourself. The curative force in psychology is man's tendency to actualize himself, to become his or her potentialities. It's a constant sense of evolving and growing. That's a, a comment by Carl Rogers. This desire to become more of what you already are, to be, I call it, actually, factually, functionally, punctually you, the unedited, unaudited, the raw, rare, rough, as well as refined and more unlimited you, is it's innate in all human beings. We don't always see it that way. We don't always say it that way. We don't always know it that way. But we are always seeking a better experience, we say, of life. Really, it's of yourself in life. How do you feel today? How did you feel yesterday? How did you feel with all the family around, all the sounds in the house? We had my baby sister and her husband, Les, come every year. He cooks all the brisket and the most of me. All we do is a turkey and chitlins. And he... <laughs> And then the greens and the pies and the, uh, all, all the things. But there's the sound of energy, the girls giggling. My nieces, Gina's uh, sister Iris and, those, and, and Madeline's two daughters come every year. And they were making their sounds with majesty downstairs. And Julian's there. My brother was there. And, of course, mom in and out. And, and there's, we have a little puppy. And then some other nephews came. And they kids were there. And there's just a different energy, a bunch of sounds in the house. Sometimes you wish they'd all go away. But, they're, but those sounds are there. They swell they increase, they get louder, and then everybody says, I enjoyed the turkey or the turkeys that were there. Uh, I enjoyed the, the uh, greens or I enjoyed somebody's pie or somebody brought a, a peach cobbler over. The, the, the general experience, though, when everybody goes home is, how did you enjoy yourself? Not just the dressing and the turkey and the, and the pies, uh, but how did you enjoy yourself? Because with many people, that setting is not pleasant for them. They don't enjoy family. They don't enjoy connections because there's too much stuff. 
un, undealt with issues, uh, unforgiveness, anger, uh, presupposed notions, things that people have carried since they were children, they bring it home for Thanksgiving. Something they never discussed, but they, they just like the, the, the turkey is baking, that issue has been baking in your life a long time. And even though you're around people who really do love you, but they really don't like you and you don't like them, uh, it's hard to get the love and likes working together. Uh, that we, we can do just one whole sermon, a whole series just on liking and loving. Do you love what you like and do you like what you love? Do you love who you like? And do you like who you love? Many people don't like who they love. And that's a conniption. <laughs> that's, a, that's a conundrum. It's, we're right in the middle of life. Do you like life? Well, we don't know. A lot of people say they love God, whoever their God is. But most people are not really... They don't like that God because that God has a lot of demands and you could easily break the rules. The normal Judeo-Christian God is making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. And so this, that fundamentalist mentality of fearing that God, loving that God, worshiping that God, uh, appeasing that God or pleasing that God, some of that is the case with people and their parents. They, they, they want to appease them and they want to please them. And uh, if they're appeasing an angry parent or pleasing a difficult parent and loving them and they love that parent or that spouse or those children all their life, and then you're confused about that issue. I think rethinking God as we talk about seeking God or seeking source, and I'm going to call it seeking self, because when I go to church and what do we come here for each week, uh, our experience has been to feel God, to experience God. One of the things we hope, we, we really want to experience the best, freest, purest, most innocent aspect of ourselves, and yet the most progressive and productive and creative as, as, uh, uh, aspect of ourselves. Our services from our Pentecostal background, they always had a sort of a peak climactic anticipation that you would feel God. And if you didn't feel God, well, the church wasn't good that Sunday. We, the God, God wasn't there. Uh, he didn't show up. The Holy Ghost didn't show up. The preacher was dead. The choir wasn't good. The musicians were off. I didn't like the ushers. The parking lot wasn't right. The sermon didn't hit. The, I didn't know what he was talking about. I mean... You probably never go through that as, as if, you, if you're not brought up in a church that has all these demands. If, you, if the church has a, a quick hour-long liturgy, it's the same thing every week. You do it. You know what's going to be done. You, you kind of read. You don't have high expectations unless something breaks. But if you don't have a liturgy, you just, but you do have an expectation of an experience that doesn't come right, uh, it's like going to your favorite restaurant every week and ordering the same thing, and one day it doesn't taste the same, or it doesn't feel the same, or you have a favorite uh, waiter or waitress at that restaurant. They know what you like. They know what you don't like. They're always there. You sit at the same table, the same area of the restaurant, the same side of the restaurant. You've been there for years, and then suddenly uh, they get a new chef, and the, it, it, the, the menu is the same, but the recipe is slightly different, or he or she adds something that, that you don't like or that you do like better than the one you had before, or they, the place is too packed, and your particular table is not available. Most folk, if you notice at Thanksgiving, sit at the same place at the table all the time. Dinner. It seems like the food tastes differently if you sit somewhere else at the table. It doesn't, but it feels like that. You feel like something wrong with your face, or you, or you, or, or you clumsy trying to eat if you're not, because we're so we're such creatures of comfort. We're not creatures of discomfort. Sometimes it's important to disrupt yourself or interrupt yourself to experience a part of yourself that you haven't yet been exposed to. You can get so comfortable, and that's why when we talk about e expanding and exposing, you also expel some things that are exposed. And that's important. It's part of life. So the desire to become more of who we already are is, is, uh, is important because we don't fully know all of who we are. The word infinite, and I'm titling this your infinite self, that means you're limitless, endless in space or extent or, or size. Uh, the part of you that's impossible to measure. Immortal, immeasurable, immediate. 
What part of you is not measurable? It is experienceable, but not measurable. When it comes to God, I don't think you could ever really know God, but you can experience God, and that's ongoing and evolutionary. To really know God would be uh, to, to be able to size God up completely. Now, you don't completely size yourself up, and if you ever get to the place where you have, then you've limited who you are, and you're not growing. All living things grow, all growing things change, and all change is a bit of a struggle. It, it's certainly a challenge. I want to expand, constantly grow. I always feel there's more. There's more to life, there's more in life, there's more about life, and there's more about living, and I want to experience as much of it as I can. I'll never experience all of it in one moment, or one experience, or one vacation, or one trip, or one piece of sweet potato pie. <laughs> Of course, I'm talking about mine. Uh, what, what do you enjoy most about yourself? When I say yourself, that's your essential being, that, that the part that distinguishes you from others. What is that? Who is that? And are you that all the time? Or do you alter that or edit that so that it fits someplace else? What part of you are you afraid to expose or experience? And at what time are you afraid to expose or experience? Your angry self, your selfish self, your self-centered self, or your overly generous self? Is there a part of yourself that you feel only belongs to you? Now, all of this are aspects of your divinity, your unique, complex, amazing, uh, fearfully and wonderfully made self. That would be God. That would be an experience of God if we're made in God's image or likeness or we're just hybrid extraterrestrials. And some of you really are. <laughs> some of us really are. Some people are wondering if years ago some extraterrestrials came down and brought in some kind of intelligence. The, if you ever watch Ancient Aliens, that's the name of the thing I was trying to tell you about the other day. Uh, I'm, I'm really into that, and it's almost into me. I've, I think I've always been an alien, but now I'm starting to get into alien, ancient aliens. <laughs> <laughs> or infinite aliens. Did I say, man, what, did I miss something over here, dude? <laughs> he's, he's laughing a little longer and a little louder. He's thinking he's been an alien ever since I've known him. <laughs> the Hindu says... If God wished to hide, God would choose man to hide in. That is the last place man or humans would look for God. We have so many religions and religious pursuits. We're looking for God in things, rituals, rites, rules, laws, literature, lectures, we're seeking God in a church or a perfect church. I often say, all of y'all looking for a perfect church. You're not going to find a perfect church. And if you do and join it, it won't be perfect no more. <laughs> now, if you see perfect as meaning expanding or perfect as meaning maximizing, then we can look for the maximization of our own self. The trouble with the masses of humanity today is that they are trying to become something that is already right within it's already there, and you're trying to find it or repair it or even replace it with something that isn't. We get so impatient with ourselves, we look for ourselves somewhere. We're always comparing and many times competing, even not only with another person, but with our last performance. Every time I cook a, a sweet potato pie, I'm actually competing with the last one. Now, I only say that because people make comments about my pie. I don't have the best pie in the world. Probably do. I don't have the best. <laughs> better than Fatty LaBelle's. But, um, but every time I, I do it, I'm thinking about the last time. I, I, I like to season things a certain way, but I'm, I don't realize I'm not competing in, a, in an aggressive, defensive, egoic way, but I want to improve every time I present. How about you? You want to improve or expand or experience something with this particular dinner or date or experience that you didn't experience with the other one, even if it's not quite as good or it's not the same. And just because it's not the same doesn't mean it's not as good. 
It's just different. When you get bored, it's because you're not expanding. When you get bored, it's because you're not taking risk. When you get bored, it's because you're not adventurous enough, you're not curious enough to do something you haven't done before, to think something you haven't thought before, to read something that may be different from what you particularly espouse, to be challenged and charged by something that is a little less comfortable and a little less comforting than before. All of that are aspects of your divinity. If, if God created a, a, well, you've heard the story that God got bored and he decided he, his time was infinite, was used, needed to be more creative. So he made man or he made the universe. And then you found out since then that there's all these planets, there's just billions of galaxies and there are galaxies and galaxies and thousands and thousands of moons and planets and stars. And how could Earth, which is very tiny in the larger scheme, be as significant as, as we thought it is? The only reason it's that significant because you're on it and you're experiencing it and you're helping create it. That's what makes it experience. That's, that's what makes it significance. How many thousands of restaurants will you never eat, have never seen, never heard of, and yet millions of people do see and hear them, and, but they're not important to you at all. You don't even know they exist. Every time there, these award shows come on, I see all these new artists who've sold 20 million songs <laughs> and I ain't never heard of them. No, not one time. They're just kids getting started, and they're getting all these awards. Now, we know the Frank Sinatras, and we know the Ella Fitzgeralds, and we know the Lena Horne, those of my generation, and you know the, the, the Mahalia Jacksons and the Aretha Franklins and the James Browns. But you got all these new young stars that, that are rapping, and, of course, my generation can't understand rapping anything but your knees and your elbows and things. Uh, but, but they're big, and they've got billions of, uh, millions of, of fans all over the world. And you go, I, just because you never heard of them, sometimes, well, I've never heard of them. They ain't heard of you either. <laughs> but you, you act like if you ain't heard of them, they ain't that important. I, I know I've, I've, inter- I've met a lot of people over the years, and a certain, when I was doing television, I had a, a, a huge audience of, of millions of people, but there are billions on the planet. And so very often, somebody would introduce me to somebody that almost apologized because they never knew me. And I thought, well, I don't expect everybody to know me. And then if they say, well, I've never heard of you before. <laughs> Sometimes they said that's, that's in a way that it's not really that important that I meet you. <laughs> now and I said, now wait just a minute here. <laughs> I ain't heard of you and don't care to meet you. You take enough time. Go on down the road. You know, the, the human part still stays there. You know, you got ego, you got self, you got mind, you got pride, you have this hurt. Now, all of that mixed together means you are living and alive. And Matt sang the song Home. Home is really not just a place or a space, but it's a consciousness that you are an original, that you are, have origination. I think that when you came into the earth with each one of us, that there was a certain sound that resonated with our essence. And it may be the sound of Om, which they say that's the sound of the universe, the hum of existence, or the I am, or Amen. That there's a certain energy, a certain syncopation, a certain resonation in that sound that is original. And when you hear it, you're reminded that you're here with purpose. Transcendental meditations will go, oh, and we go, amen, amen, amen. Scripture records God is saying, Jesus saying, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. It's saying yes, I am. It's a nod to your existence. Don't protest your existence because you're protesting your divinity. When you see yourself as here on purpose, with purpose, in time, for time, the time continuum and that which extends beyond the continuum, you, you feel a sense of worth. That you're not an accident. Every kid of multiple siblings hears at some point that they were adopted. <laughs> I remember hearing it. I cried for days. 
quietly because even though I knew it wasn't true, I believed it might be. <laughs> and my brother, of course, told me that. And but uh, they say that to hurt your feelings. And and but what some of the most wonderful experiences children have had is when they were with their adopted parent or adopted godparents or adopted siblings. Adopted doesn't mean you don't belong, that you're still a member, but there are little things that we associate with words and titles and colloquialisms that we give value to. If you don't give it any value, it doesn't affect you. But if you put too much value in it, even in your name or your last name, Everybody doesn't have to be like their father or their mother. You don't have to follow the family trend or the family business or the family. I used to wonder when my kids were small, they imagine well, I was 42 when she was born, 41 when Julian was born, so um, or 43 actually with majesty. I'm, and I'm thinking I'm 40 years older than them. them when, I, when I die, if I, they may not be ready to take over the ministry. And then the... The ministry died, and, ain't, and none of us had to worry about it. I, I was thinking, who's going to, but I never wanted to put Julian in a place. That's why I didn't name him Carlton Demetrius Pearson. I wanted to, but I didn't want him to have anything to live up or anything to live down. He would have had both, <laughs> to live up to something and to live down something. You know, if they had to hear the, the isn't your dad the guy that's the heretic? Most people don't even know what heretic is. I told you one little kid walked up to me and said, you're Majesty Pearson's father, aren't you? And I said, yes. Didn't you used to be Carlton Pearson? <laughs> I was like, what in the Hades do you, I, what, what do you mean, did I, didn't I used to be? They, 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 they see a certain image. Yeah. <laughs> People have a certain image of you. And if their image of you or your image of you changes, sometimes your name doesn't even sound the same to them. Right. You can change the color of your hair or cut the hair or change uh, sizes or, or homes or neighborhoods. or You can't change your age, but you can do what, something that makes you less identifiable by the people who identify with you. And then suddenly you have a discussion. I don't know how many people discuss politics at Thanksgiving. We just talked about turkeys. <laughs> and of course, Listen. that led straight to the White House. All right, let me. <laughs> um, if mankind or if humans would let go of trying and accept that they are, they will soon be perfectly aware of the reality of their God self. How hard do we try to be something we think we're not? How hard do we try to be something that we presume we're not? Which is usually good or good enough. You either feel like you're not good or you're not good enough. And our English word, when people say good, they're thinking of God. And when they say God, they're thinking of good. It's our, our language is the only language where good and God sound the same and are spelled similarly, then you can say, well, the devil is lived spelled backwards and God is dog spelled backwards. And then you get into all that and that don't mean nothing, but you think it might. <laughs> if you want it to mean something, it means something. If you don't want it to mean nothing, it means nothing. But you put images and expectations around the life teachings of the masters of, of the Far East have taught us all the time that we already are what we think we're looking for. One of the most perplexing scriptures in the Bible uh, is from the most famous Psalm, which is the 23rd. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not. Mo Even atheists know that one. Most people have not memorized it. They've just heard it enough to memorialize it. <laughs> The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. I want you. <laughs> you shall not want. I want to eat. I want to drink. I want to go. I want to change. I want to go. I, that's, that scripture never made any sense to me until I, I changed the, until I looked the word up. In, in fact, before I ever looked up want, the Hebrew word, I just assumed that it meant the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not lack. I shall not be without. And sometimes I shall not do without. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not be less than I am. 
The Lord is my shepherd, and I have everything, and I am everything I need. We say the Lord did it, and it's really always somebody helped the Lord do it. You, you, you can say that, the, well, the Lord did it. And the, the, when I was coming up, a lot of us people in my tradition were humbled or humbled, poor, not uh, extended, uh, ex, um, distinguishedly educated. The culture was, as a kid in the, born in the 50s, most African-Americans in Pentecostal circles were not highly educated, highly intellectual. We, we were humbled and sometimes humiliated just on the job. So to say, for somebody who has very little, never had much, to say, God touched me, or God spoke to me, or, or I had an experience of God, you could say, the white man, the black man, the red man, the fat man, it, whoever don't like me, that's all right. God spoke to me. I had a lot of very lonely people who felt very little significance take a whole new attitude when they say, yeah, but the Lord showed me. The Lord touched me Sunday morning. Ooh, that was God. Ooh, the Lord. The Holy Ghost was in there. I mean, of all the billions of people on the planet, God touched you. Now, that's from that, that, that Pentecostal experience that was very real to us, it remains very real to us, and we literally felt God touched us. And I cried, or I felt, I used to call them Holy Ghost doodads. But then I began to think some of the most humbled or humiliating or humiliated people boasted of knowing God. I know the Lord spoke to me. The Lord showed me. The Lord said it. The Lord did it. Here's what God said. Now, that's common in our expression. That's common in our experience. For people who don't consider having a personal relationship with God, it's like, who do you think you are? What are you talking about? you got to be crazy. I was talking to somebody, a very dear friend of mine recently, who, who called me, and she heads up a, 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 a huge ministry for broken and hurting women who've been abused and have gone through mental illness. She, does a, she has degrees in mental illness and in psychology, she had a breakdown. She called me from in the middle of the night, like two o'clock in the morning, from the psych ward. And I, I called the next day to follow up, and she said, I'm, I'm in the psych ward because I felt God spoke to me, and I told my family that what God said, and what, what God was saying to her, her family disagreed with it because it, it didn't make sense to them, though they're of the same religious background, and she, and she Begin to break it down. The Holy Ghost did this, and he and God, God spoke to me so strongly. I bumped my head when I was listening to God, and he was choking me, telling me. And I said, who'd you tell that? You can tell me that that's cool, because I know what you're talking about, and I, know, and I know what you're not talking about. But she said, well, I told that to the psychiatrist. I said, oh, my God, you'll never get out. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know this girl. She's a preacher's kid. She's my age. She's grown up around the church. And I said, you can't tell that to everybody. Your family doesn't even want, in fact, the way you describe the Holy Ghost was very abusive to you. Tripped you and choked you and threw you down and bumped your head. God trying to talk to me so he killed my loved one. God trying to talk to me so I had a car crash. God trying to get my attention. All these horrible things. I said, you got a mean God. That God might be arrested for abuse. Is that your experience of God? I said, now you're going to have trouble getting out. I didn't see her as crazy. I just saw her as excessive, overly emotional, too much. Some things you don't tell or you tell them differently, but you, can't ex you don't necessarily experience th them differently. I said, there's something about you that thinks you need to be hit with a, over the head with a pole to hear God. Why do you need a violent experience to feel God? or a vicious experience, or a violating experience. Wrap your arms around yourself one more time. Who is, who is this that you're hugging? Or afraid to hug? Do you know who that person is? I think you're divine. And you do too. But you'll never say it unless somebody says otherwise. I can tell you how wonderful you are, and you go, oh, you don't really know me. And I can say, you're a loser, a lowlife. You have nothing going for you. Your nostrils will flare, 
and you look at the, the non-carry laws, <laughs> and whatever amendment says you can hit me back, because deep in your soul, you know there's something incredibly marvelous about you. I want to close with, with um, a Marianne Williams' uh, statement that Mandela, Nelson Mandela quoted in his inaugural speech, and it's very, very powerful. Um, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, she writes, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people will not feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Take those arms and just move that energy around and say, I'm fantastic, say it, I'm, I'm divine. I seek myself, not somebody else, not outside me. I just want to experience me at the highest, purest, most powerful, healthy and holy of, uh, form that I can. When you've done that, I think you've met God as you. And that sounds idolatrous, but another, I think it's idolatrous to find God otherwise. Because the greatest experience of you is the one that you'll have of yourself. I believe in you. Thank you, great God, as us, in us, through us, to us, around us, for being us. For reminding us that we are and that we are one. Thank you for allowing us to feel lonely when we isolate others and alienate others and experience the illusion of lack. We embrace all that is and say yes, amen, ah, I am, om. We allow that interesting sound to resonate in our spirits in a way that others hear it silently. Thank you that all is well and the best is yet to come. Thank you, great God. And so it is. Everybody say it, so it is. Give somebody a high five next year. High five and say, you're so cool. So I've been admiring those shoes the whole time we've been here. <laughs> Thank you for coming for this to this service. It's going to become increasingly experiential as we find ways to make you experience yourself at a higher, healthier level every time you come. Whether that's a song or a solo or an instrumentalist or a poem or a sermon, we want you to have a, a marvelous experience of yourself. And when you leave, somebody will say, how did you enjoy yourself? And you say, I always enjoy myself. Because myself is all I am. That's all I have. Peace and blessing be upon you. We'll see you again next week. Shake somebody's hand, hug somebody before you go, would you? It's a great day, make it so. Hey, we're so happy you're visiting with us online today. We love connecting with people all across the country and around the world sharing our powerful message of love beyond belief. There's something new happening here. You can now join All Souls as a virtual member. Our virtual membership is designed for friends who live outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and who want to engage with All Souls in a meaningful way. You can be part of an expanding family, a global family, really, wherever you are. If you live in Oklahoma, Ohio, or Orange County, California, Canada, or Cameroon, by becoming a virtual member, you'll be able to deepen your connections with members and friends here in Tulsa and with members wherever you are. Each week, you'll receive special All Souls content tailored for you, our virtual members. 
Virtual members have access to pastoral care, to personal prayers, and also receive invitations to exclusive web events. You can learn more, and if you're ready, you can become a virtual member today by visiting allsoulschurch.org forward slash virtual membership. We're grateful our ministries are having a positive impact on your life, and we want to share the good news of Love Beyond Belief with more and more people. So no matter what, we need your support to keep this ministry growing and thriving. So please consider making a gift today. You can do so by texting Love BB for Love Beyond Belief to 73256 or simply visit our website. You are a blessing in our lives. May you be blessed. And be a blessing.